Um, I'm just going to put in the OBS so you guys can see us. <laughs> okay. Okay, welcome everybody to this evening. Um, as you know, this is our Interaction Design Foundation group. Uh, for those of you who, have, who haven't been here before, the IDF was um, established in 2002 and collaborates with universities, companies such as Stanford, Cambridge, and, and SAP Labs, as well as other noted authors as Clayton Christensen and Don Norman. Um, they, they, the reason they started up was basically to create, to ensure that there's Ivy League education available for everyone at a very low cost. Um, so, so it's not free, <laughs> but it's very low cost and it's of the highest quality. Um, yeah, so this evening we're going to have Indy, uh, Indy Young from San Francisco, who's going to be talking about paying proper attention to the problem. Indy is a freelance researcher who coaches, writes, and speaks about inclusive software strategy, bringing depth and breadth of knowledge about people's purposes via painstaking, painstaking detail of listening sessions and synthesis. When paid with big data trends, solutions based research, design thinking, jobs to be done, and agile methods, her mental, models di mental model diagrams, opportunity maps, and thinking style segments let you organize and activate better support for farm for far many more people. Um, yeah. So uh, I don't know if you read any bit of background. Does anybody in the audience know who Indy Young is? What kind of UX designers are you? <laughs> <laughs> but basically, um, uh, if you have a look um, online, go and try and find her books. There's some amazing books. I'm currently listening to the one audio book. It's called Practical Empathy. I still haven't finished. I'm like halfway through. There's still like another two more hours left, but it's really, really awesome. Um, and if you want to be a proper, if you want to do research like a boss, then this is the right book to listen to. Uh, there's also another book that she's done, which is called Mental Models, um, which is aligning design strategy and human behavior. I haven't read it, but it sounds cool. And I think we should all read it. Um, I think we should maybe even have like a book, uh, book club where we can go through these kind of specific books because there's a lot of things that we miss um, when we don't share these kind of, this kind of information. Uh, but these are some of the top recommended UX books that we, sh that we can, um, that you could get. Um, one of the other things uh, that I wanted to say, uh, yeah, so Indy began her career as a software engineer and moved into an interaction design and worked with early tab tablets in 2001. She's also the co-founding partner of Adaptive Path and pioneering UX, which is a pioneering UX agency responsible for knowledge sharing by many channels. Uh, she also got a degree in computer science um, as well as uh, master's in computer science, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm reading from the <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, uh, there's also, if you look at her website, indyyoung.com, you can also access um, articles, podcasts, presentations, and a whole lot of awesome resources. Okay, um, so let me rather sit, put it over to Indy. Okay. You unshare your screen and I will share mine. Uh, sorry, let me find my button. Oh, this is. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> find the mouse is hard. Okay. Okay, cool. And now I will share my screen. Hi, everybody. By the way, before I actually share it, great to meet you guys. Super excited. Um, uh, Chez and I have been trying to set this up for, I don't know, what, six, eight months or something. So I'm super happy we're finally doing it. Yay! <laughs> um, and I want to talk to you guys about um, the things that I have based my entire career on, which is truly understanding people so that we can build the right things for them and build different things for them. Uh, one of the biggest um, issues that I run into is um, worldwide, we're still building software for like everybody, kind of a one size fits all uh, solution. And it's so much better, not only for a startup, but for large corporations to find a very specific fit um, and then launch from there. So anyway, um, I'm just gonna get started. This is uh, an illustration from my book. And uh, I do have that first book that says, uh, actually the first book, uh, 
Practical Empathy is available on Audible. And then the second book she mentioned is actually my first book, and I am rewriting it. Every single word is different. It was supposed to come out early next year, uh, but I am sort of ran into a, a problem, which is why you see me in this space. <laughs> my regular space got completely ruined by rain, so we're trying to rebuild it, and I'm in the neighbor's um, back bedroom. Hello! <laughs> Anyway, so, um, so we will soldier on, but um, the idea is that um, we're all building for one size fits all. A couple of years ago, I was working with a group at a, uh, an airline, and they were seeing data come from their superiors that looked a lot like this. This happens to be the breakdown of how many passengers in one particular day checked their bag versus didn't, carried on, right? Or didn't have a bag to check. And you can see it's broken down by gender and by age and whether they checked it in at the curbside or at an agent, blah, 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 that kind of thing. Um, and from this, of course, you're seeing that big difference between females and males highlighted first. So the stakeholders are all, you know, like, wow, Females have a lot more stuff to take with them, so of course I've checked their bags, you know, about makeup, can't even go through security. So yeah, they've got to check their bags, which is a little bit of a fallacy. Um, and I kind of stopped the team there, and they said to me, well, what if we just redistribute the data that we got? What if we say, you know, things that are a little bit more connected to the likelihood that they'll have to pack more, like, you know, the length of the trip. Maybe they have to pack more for a long trip and pack less for a short trip. Um, or maybe they're checking their bag on the way home as opposed to on the way to their destination. Um, or maybe they're checking their bag if they've got a connection and they don't want to have to drag it through the connecting airport and stuff. They're all like, oh, I'm brilliant. And I'm all like, okay, not so fast. Let's go do some real research. Let's go talk to people about why they check their bag and why they don't check their bag. Let's see what's going through their minds. And this is the kind of stuff that we got. It had absolutely nothing to do with the length of trip. It had obviously nothing to do with gender or age. It had more to do with experience. So there was a group of people who had experienced um, horrible things happening to their suitcases when they came out of the uh, little conveyor belts. Um, like one of them, he had white powder on his suitcase a couple of times and that was back during this anthrax scare that they had in the US. Um, so he's all like, oh, I'm not going to check my bag ever again. Um, and uh, then there's also the people, he's still on the left-hand side of this slide, who had something that's very precious to them. A guy who was in a band would always carry on his guitar. Um, a guy who is a classical cellist would always actually buy a seat for his cello. Um, there was a man who was taking, he's an ophthalmologist, and he was taking a laser device, medical device, to Nepal to donate it um, and run a little uh, session on how to use it for some small town out in Nepal. And he's all like, you know, if I let the the luggage gorillas get a hold of it, it'll be completely uncalibrated and useless to us. So that's the kind of thinking that's going into whether you check your bag or not. There's a couple more here I'm not going to go through. Um, but what that team at the airline was experiencing is called cognitive bias. How many of you guys have heard of cognitive bias? Whoa, okay, either I can't see your, yeah, one, okay, good. Ah, good, I will teach you. Um, cognitive bias is something all of us do. There's no way for us to not do it because it's deep inside our brain. And it is back from when we, you know, were more Neanderthal, um, <laughs> recognizing things and trying to classify them quickly so we didn't get eaten by the tiger, so to speak, right? So really all it is is our brain picking out patterns. And it gives us a good feeling. It might be pumping out a little dopamine when we pick out a pattern right? Okay, good. This is the pattern. That is the tiger. I'm going this direction. Um, <laughs> so that's all cognitive biases. But when we take it to the level of our data, we have these really bad habits of thinking that it's important. And there's this really great website. Write down this, um, this URL that I have at the bottom. You can spend a good 15 minutes being entertained with spurious correlations. You just go find data that looks similar over the years. 
And in here, they're saying, you know, the divorce rate in Maine looks very similar to the per capita consumption of margarine. They're both going down. So thank God we're not eating margarine anymore. More marriages are being saved. <laughs> right? Anyway, um, that's what cognitive bias is. We leap to this. Um, there are several other people out there who are speaking out about it. Carl Fast. Um, also talks a little bit about this fallacy of the word science. We like to be scientific um, and therefore whatever data we have proves something. And we're using this vocabulary incorrectly. The, the vocabulary around proving really it belongs to natural science, physics, biology. It doesn't belong to our you know, artificial science, the building of things for humans by humans. Um, but what we're doing is we're trying to say, you know, this feel scientific so that our stakeholders feel comfortable with the risks. It's all we're doing. Erica Hall, definitely someone you guys will want to read, and she's been out and about the world giving lots of talks and has written a bunch of really good books. Um, this is an, from an essay she wrote about surveys, about how it feels so good to have numbers that are objective and I'm not, you know, influencing the data. But by golly, you have influenced the way you wrote that survey. And that survey is twisted in a way that you end up getting the results that you expect, unless you're super, super careful. And I guarantee there's probably about 10 people in the world who can do it correctly. <laughs> um, so surveys, not a great source of data, very full of minefields. Alan Cooper, how many people have heard of Alan Cooper? Rutro, okay, we're not getting our names out far enough. Okay, so he's the guy who wrote The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. Um, that's a book that introduced the concept of personas. Raise your hand if you've used personas. I am, you kind of, okay, all right, good, well, there's some readings some of you guys may want to do, or at least just get online, Google him. This is from a talk he gave. Um, there's tons of recorded talks out here. You can watch them real quick. Much easier than writing, reading a book if you're more into that sort of thing. Um, but here is the data telling us something that proves something when it's really not. It's really not, this is all cognitive bias. There's a couple of other kinds of bias that I wanna to introduce to you. One of them is called systemic bias, something you are probably very familiar with in South Africa. Um, but it's the idea that um, in the culture, there have historically been built in to the way we process things and the way things run, a bias from history. In this particular book by Kathy O'Neill, this is like a book on fire, and it's so hard to read because she goes through chapter by chapter all these biases in all these algorithms, in all these, like the medical field, in judging, um, making sentences, in, in insurance. And in fact, in insurance, she's all like, you know what? It's actually decided how much you pay for insurance by your zip code, not by whether you've been caught and arrested for driving drunk, right? So anyway, there's these horrifying things. Joy Bolanomini has the algorithmic justice league. She's at MIT. She's the one who brought to the fore and has given a lot of talks about the idea that the processing that Google has created for photo recognition, for recognizing human faces, has been trained on white males. It did not recognize her face. You should see some of her talks. They're like her examples are horrifying. And this is the crappy software that we have to deal with right now. We have to fix it. You guys are the next generation that are gonna make it better, but we have to start with awareness, okay? So it's super, super important to be aware of this. The idea that the data from the past, even though we say we don't you know, make decisions this way, anymore, it still has crept into a lot of the algorithms. It's crept into the way that we run certain processes. Um, and so that's what we're trying to avoid is doing dissemination based on any sort of demographic. That's systemic bias. There's also something called ROI bias. ROI, anyone? What does it stand for? Yes? 
Okay, everybody gets it. Return on investment. I can't hear you guys say anything. <laughs> um, so I often, often hear teams say, well, we've got to optimize for ROI. Um, and, and yeah, I'd really love to support everybody, but I have to focus just on the folks who are going to give me a good return. And that means I'm not going to be investing in a set of code for people who have a low probability of providing good ROI. And this is systemic bias. This is exactly systemic bias and they are completely unaware of it. This is like a classic definition of I'm going to go after the people who have good return because historically they've had a good return. I'm going to give low insurance rates to the people in this zip code because historically they haven't had that many problems or they have more money, right? Systemic bias. So what companies around the world are now trying to do is A, become more aware of it, and B, work towards something beyond just pure ROI. This is Peter Falk at BMW. Uh, design works and he's all like, you know, why can't we open it up beyond just, you know, our, our profit to things like opportunity cost or opportunities to invest um, or some sort of other influences um, in the community or globally. So we're trying to bring these things into the decisions that we're making when we're making design decisions. Also, when we're making decisions about who to research and where to take our research projects. So there's also another one um, to be aware of, and that's demographic assumptions. Uh, you guys are probably super aware of it culturally, but here in California, we often get stakeholders going, well, we need to serve the Spanish-speaking demographic, so make a Spanish-speaking version of this software. Um, I hate this. It's my little soapbox, because within any language you have a lot of different thinking styles and you should be trying to make your software match the thinking styles and approaches that people have not match or make the assumption that because someone speaks a certain language they all think the same way demographic bias demographic bias appears in personas so if anyone has ever run across a persona like these on the Page, you'll see that there's a lot of information that's trying to make these, you know, sort of like characters come to life. But if you look at the details, they're all the same exact person. They are all thinking and behaving within the same parameter, the same context. So we don't have three different personas. We have one with different demographic sets on it. Big deal. What we need to look at is the roots. And I'm going to get into this a little bit later in this talk. So that you can understand how to do that. Um, so the fifth one is cultural blindness. Um, very similar to systemic bias, but it's more like group think. Um, you know, we were raised in a certain culture. We, we start to think that everybody's just like us. Uh, Sarah Walker Bocher, this is an extremely good book um, called Technically Wrong. She goes through all sorts of different pieces of software out there and shows how they are biased. And she, her, her big message is, you know, the more that this software is on phones that everybody around the globe is using, the better we need to get at understanding the differences between the way people think and making our software work differently for different people. Okay. Um, the common way of making software, whether you're doing agile stand-up meetings or whether you're doing it in another way, it's very group thinking. It's very defined by the people who are in that room. And so what we need to do is try to not only get more people on the team that have different backgrounds, different thinking styles. Um, maybe not everybody went through university, um, but we also need to get that into our research. So here's my... Um, Long tail. You guys may not have heard of the long tail. Raise your hand if you've heard of that. No. Okay, let me explain long tail first. It came about, I think the phrase came around 2003 or so, to mean that, oh wow, now that we've got the internet, uh, retailers, this is only about retailers, retailers 
suddenly can now stock a whole heck of a lot more products and keep them in a warehouse and ship them than narrowing it down and filtering out the products that don't get bought a lot because they only have one little brick and mortar store to fit those products in. Okay, so the long tail meant up there at the head, the neck, like the giraffe part of it, um, that used to be where the bricks and mortar were. And so that was what that ROI bias was about. You know, I'm going to focus and filter out the stuff that doesn't get bought, focus on the stuff that does get bought and support that. So it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now with the internet, this is back in 2003 when they, now with the internet, we can, we can sell anything. Like we can sell a printer cartridge once a year to one person and still make a profit because you know, it's just somewhere in some hidey hole in a warehouse and it doesn't cost us to stock it. We don't have to make shelf space for it. So now this long tail is coming back around, but now it's in terms of supporting different thinking styles. The us, the people who are culturally had similar experiences and contexts to us are there at the head, at the neck, at the top of the giraffe. What's happening is we're being able to support people that are out there in the market and then in the green, even beyond the market. So many businesses, so many startups think about their market, define their market, and either define it like as everyone, which is never true, or they define it as, you know, just a market with money, right? As opposed to the, mar the larger market out there. So there's a lot of opportunity. This is a summary slide of everything that I just mentioned that I want us as user experience folks, as designers, as researchers to be super aware of. I'm using that word woke. I'm sort of uh, like borrowing it just for our little world. These are the five things. We need to know about cognitive bias. We need to make our radar pick it up so that we can stop the team and go like, no, wait, let's go do some real research and understand this. We need to understand what system, which means talking. They may be on board already. Uh, trying to avoid the words that represent demographics whenever you refer to a user. Instead, talking about them in terms of their thinking style. And also being aware that your own culture, your own background and context, and your team's background and context is influencing what you are creating. And so being able to be aware of that, that might be fine for now, but eventually you will want to go beyond that. Okay, so if we're going to do this, we need a whole generation of folks around the world who understand what thinking styles are, have the ability to go out and research them, and also have the ability to bring more diverse thinking styles to their design teams. There's a huge hue and cry after all this Facebook crap that's been going on to have people who have a background in the arts and humanities on software teams, because those are the folks who have understood ethics and understand how to think through what possible future disadvantages might happen. Whereas the tech folks are just like, oh, wow, this is great. We can do this. And they just do it. And then it kind of has bad repercussions. So anyway, that's one of the things that's happening here in the US. Um, I think it can take a lot of different forms in a lot of different countries because we all have different contexts that we're working in. Um, but Facebook is worldwide and it's affecting us all. It's really affecting us all. So what we need to be able to do, this is back to that same screen that I showed before, <clears throat> be able to get out there, be able to understand the real reasoning that people are using to get something done, not the reasoning that they're using to use the software you're building or whatever you've designed, the service you've designed, the reasoning that they've used to get something done, a larger purpose. And in order to do that, in order to understand that, to walk in someone's shoes, to see through their eyes, we really have to use empathy. So, what is empathy? You guys probably all have a definition running around in your head. 
let me tell you, there are many definitions. Uh, pretty much everybody thinks of uh, fuzzy bunnies and rainbows when they think of empathy here in Silicon Valley. They're like, empathy, who needs it? There's actually even books out there who are like, against empathy, we don't need empathy, you know, that kind of thing. And, and people are defining it differently in different um, articles. We've got like, oh, it's just good intentions and trying to be a better self. Oh, no, it's emotional re you know, intelligence, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of different definitions. Guess what? I went and did research for that book. And in the psychology world, there are at least eight different kinds of empathy, all of them valid. Um, the written world, though, the business world, they all seem to come down to just saying, hey, you've know, you got to just be more sensitive. But sensitivity is not empathy. Emotion is not empathy. Empathy is not an emotion. Empathy is about listening. So look, I replaced all those little hearts with ears because I seriously think whenever you say the word empathy, everybody's all like, heart, little heart. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's not use the heart symbol. Let's use the ear symbol because that is what empathy is about. It's about finding out. It's about listening, okay? So that's the super important bit that I want you guys to take away from this talk today. Um, here are some of the defined types of empathy in the psychology world. I'm gonna talk about three of them, and we will go through Emotional contagion, affective empathy, and cognitive empathy. Emotional contagion first, though, uh, because I think this is closest to the definition of the little heart that everybody thinks, uh, you know, empathy is an emotion. It's not an emotion. But emotional contagion is when you want to change someone's mood. So if you have ever maybe watched a movie that made you cry, the director, the producer, the actors, they're all about trying to shift your mood, right? When we watch that scene in Black Panther and you go through the little screen and you see the whole like untouched by European civilization world there, it's like you feel an emotion. They did that on purpose, okay? There's also the idea like if you've ever tried to have a party or something, you wanna set the mood for the party or if you've ever like, you know you have to go work out you don't feel like it, and so you put on some sort of workout music to sort of get yourself in the mood, you're doing emotional contagion to yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. So in your work, emotional contagion, it can be used to cause an emotion in someone, but usually it is used in a dark way with dark patterns. It's used to cause people to click farther or scroll more or buy something they didn't intend to buy. You could use it to make people feel trust. You could use it to make your people feel valued, feel safe. I know there's a lot of bank sites out there that do a lot of work around using emotional contagion to make people feel safe and trust when they're using an online app to get at their money in their bank account. Okay. So there are positive uses of emotional contagion. Let me tell you though, most of the ones that I see out there are negative. And I want you guys to start to be aware of it. In fact, there is a website out there called darkpatterns.org that you can contribute to whenever you run across a dark pattern. Um, so that's what emotional, wait a minute, I'm already going that way. Um, so what I want to talk about next is affective empathy. Affective is the psychology word for emotional, but I don't want to use the word emotional because then it starts going back to that heart thing and people think, oh, empathy is something you feel. No. Okay. Affective empathy is the process of connecting with someone. It's not the process of trying to make someone feel better. It's the process of connecting someone, and it happens when you recognize they are going through an emotion, okay? Dr. Brene Brown, fabulous person for you guys to go out, look at some of her TED Talks. This, uh, you might want to get this Earl down here, because this is a little animation to a talk that she gave. 
later, somebody went back to the recording and animated it. And here she's defining affective empathy. First, you have to be able to recognize another person is having an emotion. Second, you tell yourself their emotion is their truth. It's valid. It's in their context. Never, never tell a person they should not feel the emotion they're feeling. Okay? The third one is communicate to them that you recognize they're having an emotion as a way of inviting them to connect with you, as a way of offering your hand if they want to share some of their emotion with you, talk about their emotion. And as they talk about their emotion, should they accept your invitation, uh, you stay out of judgment. Their emotion is valid. Their world, the reaction that they've had to their context is a total human valid reaction. And you listen. And by God, this kind of listening, this effective empathy listening, helps that person relieve them of that emotion. It's stunning. It's amazing how well it works. And in your work, um, oh wait, I have one more definition. How many people have seen that Pixar movie, Inside Out? Okay, more homework. This is really fun. Go watch this movie. <laughs> um, it's about emotions in an 11 year old girl. And as she's growing up, the emotions are changing, but there's two emotions. The one in the yellow dress is joy. And the one with the blue face is sadness. And the pink elephant is like a friend of theirs are going on a mission and it's time critical. But the pink elephant loses his favorite um, toy or wagon or something off the edge of this cliff. And he stops. And Joy is like trying to tickle him and make him laugh so that they can get going and finish this time dependent quest. Instead, Sadness recognizes that he's having an emotion, goes over there, sits down and says she recognizes it. She says, that thing meant a lot to you, didn't it? He talks a little bit about it. He cries, and 42 seconds later, he gets up and is ready to madness. Like, how did you do that? That's what emotional empathy is. This scene is playing out what these little steps are here. Okay, so fun homework assignment. <laughs> In your work, you use effective empathy when you are listening to someone. You might be listening to a coworker. You might be listening to someone on your team with whom uh, you disagree. You may be listening to someone who has disagreed with someone else on your team and you're the neutral third party. You may be listening to someone that you are doing research on to find out how they think so that you can develop and design something that will help them better than just a one-size-fits-all solution. That's when you use effective empathy. Okay, so cognitive empathy, um, I dwell on this a lot in practical empathy. And cognitive empathy is like it sounds, it's purposely trying to get an understanding of the thoughts that are running through another person's mind. It's basically trying to understand their inner voice as they pursue a very particular purpose. It's specifically looking for their reasoning, their thinking, their reactions, and their guiding principles. And it's a very specific way to conduct a listening session so that you get at these deep things. And in your work, this is how you develop a body of knowledge about how other people think. It's how you develop thinking styles. It's how you develop mental model diagrams. Okay. So there's one more thing. I mentioned that phrase, walk in someone else's shoes. I think there's various phrases around the world that we use to try to demonstrate seeing through someone else's eyes. Um, the idea of doing that often is based on make-believe and people don't take the time to develop cognitive empathy first. They just want to apply it because that's the fun part. I want to pretend I'm this person and this is how I'm thinking or walking, right? Um, and they do it based on their research. They do it based on imagination. So my whole uh, career, I've been teaching people how to develop cognitive empathy and bringing it in to use as a source for our design decisions and as a source for 
a replacement for that science sort of thing where people were like, oh yeah, this proves that you know, we're, we're risk-free. No, 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 that doesn't, but this does. Okay, so here's a very complex diagram. It's on my website if you want to check it out. Um, everything on the right is something that's already been drawn by someone else. It is the way that people develop things. So this one happens to be the continuous dual track approach where you're doing product discovery and product development in parallel. Um, so, wait a minute. Okay, there we go. I saw that too. Um, <laughs> on the left is understanding people, is developing empathy. And what I've done is I've, de I've de just designated these two things, this problem space and the solution space. In the solution space, you have someone called a user who has a relationship to your organization, maybe as a potential customer, maybe as an existing customer, um, but it's a user. In the problem space, we never use the word user because you're looking into people trying to accomplish a purpose and not looking at people using anything, not looking at people who are in relationship to an organization trying to get a service out of them. You're just looking at the way that they're trying to accomplish a purpose. And unfortunately, uh, this idea of problem space and solution space has not, it's gotten a little confused by some other authors uh, where they're thinking the problem space is just the part of research that we do in like two days to try to define what our ideas are for the solution. It's not about generating ideas for a solution. It's also not about your solutions at all. So this is the um, design thinking uh, diagram. Hopefully you guys are all familiar with this. It's as if up until now, most organizations have only been working in the solution space. So very few organizations work in the problem space. It's as if we're ignoring it. So we get so caught up in ideas because ideas are how we get cred, right? That's how we advance in our careers is by having good ideas. And so that's why we're ignoring the problem space and we're focusing our ideas on like the tasks and goals that people have and we're ignoring what their purpose is. So, for example, a task might be book a flight if you're talking about an airline. A, a, a goal might be plan a vacation if the purpose is to take my mom to the Grand Canyon. And she's never seen it. And I want her to have that whoa moment when you walk up to the edge and it's like, whoa, so powerful. And pretty soon she's not going to be able to walk anymore. And i um, really like her to be able to walk up to the edge. So how am I going to get her to the Grand Canyon especially when she does not like taking small planes. So we'll have to do a road trip, right? So which airport is better to fly into? Also, she's flying into a different city than I. Now, all of these things that I just mentioned are very, very common. You've probably thought something similar, not with regard to your mom, but you know, how am I gonna meet up with my friends um, you know, in this other location? How are we all gonna coordinate this? Um, and in fact, that first red arrow points to a mental space called to explore what it takes to get to that destination, which is one of the largest sections of the mental model diagram that I did for the airline. This mental model diagram, um, this is the spreadsheet version of it. The spreadsheet version was like 9,000 lines long of data. Uh, we did listening sessions with 100 people. Um, Look at that second arrow there. Make the original reservation. That is where the airline begins. They do not support anything up above it. Um, if I opened up Explore What It Takes to Get to That Destination, we can see like the very first tower is called Consider Whether to Fly or Not. And then the things in that are about analyzing whether flying two people to Montana is more economical than driving. You know, all these very specific things with specific um, uh, quotes from people. So the quotes, you see those numbers in the middle? Anything to the right of those numbers, those numbers are ID numbers for each person that we did a listening session. 
and the thing to the right is the actual quote from that listening session. I'm taking all that data, wrapping it up, analyzing it, putting it together, and all we've got still from this airline is this way of making a reservation. It's laughable. There is so much opportunity out there. It's laughable. And this is still a one-size-fits-all interface. So back to the problem space. I would love it if we could pay a little bit more attention, maybe once a year. Not with every cycle of development. It does not fit into the cycles. You can see there's a dotted line in between it. Not a part of the development cycle. It's something completely separate. You do it once a year, once every other year. And what you do is you try to explore purposes. These are pictures of people's great-grandparents. I, uh, I asked online for people to send them in because um, I want to emphasize that a person's purpose is larger than technology. So let's say I'm an insurance company. I could get in a time machine, go back in time, and still do listening sessions with great-grandparents who had gotten in a crash, even though it was a horse and buggy. Even though they didn't have insurance because it didn't exist. There's still stuff that goes through their head about recovering from an accident that we, is valid and would help us today. Okay, we don't have time machines, so we can't do this. But this is the point that I'm trying to make. A purpose has nothing to do with technology. Um, here's a little diagram that um, is going to come out in the new book, kind of helping you sort out generative versus evaluative research, qualitative versus quantitative, where UX or user research is, where usability research is, where big data analytics is, and where our problem space research is. It's a very different thing, and it's bringing with it a lot more value. Okay, so when do you know that you need design cycle? You ask yourself, which thinking styles am I designing for and what's the purpose that I need to craft a solution for? If you have an answer, you do not need to go do any more problem-based research. You have an answer. But your thinking styles can't be everybody. It has to be a very specific way of thinking. You could design for yourself, but you have to define that as a specific way of thinking. If you don't have answers to that, um, well, wait, if you do have answers to that, you shift to their perspective and choose the purpose that you're studying, and then you walk in their shoes. Okay? This is what you're doing. If you can't do this, then you do need research. Okay? Questions? All right, let's talk a little bit about listening sessions. Um, and uh, listening session is really all about following what a person wants to tell you. Um, it's not about having a list of questions. There's no interview questions, there's no protocol. You just sit down with somebody and you say, hey, listen, you were trying to get X done, a larger purpose, right? Recover from an accident. What was everything that went through your mind? And then making sure that you dive deeper using several techniques that I discuss in my books um, so that you get to those lower level things. So reasoning, the reactions, and the guiding principles. It's really important to have an empathic mindset when you're doing a listening session. You're not a researcher. So you're not going to have the lab coat and the checklist and, you know, make sure you know, test that person, see if you can find the knowledge in them, right? Uh, you're also not an explorer. You don't lead a search. A person is going to tell you what they have lived and what they have thought, and you are a listener to witness that speaker. That's what the empathic mindset is. Okay, so... I, um, I do teach this in workshops and in advanced online remote series. Um, also in the books, it's very learnable and people love when they learn this. They love what they can get out of it, not only for work, but also for family. <laughs> um, anyway, I keep mentioning those three things to listen for. They're at the bottom here in blue, reasoning, which is your inner thinking, right? Your reactions and your guiding principles. The, the, the operating principles by which you make decisions. 
Normally though, when you're in conversation with somebody, you will start to notice that it tends to be about explanation. It tends to be about opinion or statements of fact or generalizations. And the reason why we can't stay at the surface level is that cognitive empathy cannot form at that level. I cannot understand their inner reasoning at that level. I can only understand their reasoning when I get into their reasoning, when I get their reactions, and when I have them explained by these principles. Okay, so that's why we're trying to get down to that level. This is the slide that has the definitions of what reasoning, reactions, and guiding principles are. Um, by the way, I switched from using the word feelings and emotion because so many people in business um, reacted strongly to the idea that you know, we should be looking into emotions when we're trying to you know, help an engineer design a car. Emotions shouldn't be involved in it. Well, actually it is, right? Um, so I started calling them reactions and now people are fine with it. It's just a sleight of hand with vocabulary. Um, guiding principles are like philosophies. They're kind of, they might be based on your values. They might be based on your superstitions. Um, but they're the operating instructions by which you make decisions. Okay. So thinking styles, this is one of the things that I create out of a listening session. These are some example thinking styles. This is from a company that does software for different medical purposes. And there was this one set of software that they helped a client create for people who were trying to lose weight. And so they went and did a lot of listening sessions and they found out that there were three different approaches to losing weight, the goal of losing weight. Now we were not looking at any specific service. We're not doing usability testing. We're not doing user research. We're doing problem space research. And so it turned out that the three different approaches, um, one of them they called the resigned. I've, I've tried losing weight before. It never seems to work for me. I distrust um, you know, prescribed ways of doing it, et cetera. There was another one, it was called the sidetracked. And um, it, you know, when I'm paying attention to it, it'll work for me, but I can't always keep these habits top of mind. Um, and then there's the inconsistent, like I can do this, I've done it in the past, but right now my mom's in the hospital and I can't eat healthy, right? Or I'm on business trips all the time and I have to go to fast food joint. You know, it's just like circumstances changed. You'll notice below in the blue, green, and brown, there are completely different packages to support these different people, these different thinking styles. So first, the software would identify what kind of thinking style you are and then bring up the different content. It's written in a different tone of voice. It has completely different uh, sections to it. This is the idea of supporting people where they are, supporting a thinking style differently, okay? Um, I wrote this really long medium piece that defines the difference between personas and thinking styles. Um, I called it describing personas and basically it's all uh, about a call to get your demographics out of your personas because you're not doing any service and in fact you're doing a lot of harm because of the cognitive bias that comes out of it. Um, anyway, so that's up on Medium. Um, how many people uh, read Medium? Oh, excellent. Okay, yay, good. <laughs> I had no idea like how far this reach was. Okay. Um, and I've got a, a whole section of essays up there too that you can explore. Um, so thinking styles are demographics-free mindsets for the characters that you might then write into user scenarios or design scenarios, okay? It's a mindset that you might be in. The interesting thing about a thinking style is that it is context-specific. So you yourself might be one thinking style you know, one year and a different thinking style another year. Going back to those weight loss ones, I mean, you might be the inconsistent one year and then another year you might be the, um, the person who, whose mother is in the hospital and, and is just like feels out of control of their diet, okay? It's not a horoscope kind of a thing where you're always that person forever your, your entire life and in every aspect of your life. 
So the idea of thinking styles is to be able to support a broader set of people, um, also to raise your awareness of different cultures and different approaches that people bring. Even within your own country, there are a lot of different cultures. Uh, to stop your assumptions from guiding the decisions. Um, you're still gonna have your assumptions. They're gonna come up, but you're gonna recognize that they came up because you're more aware. And you're gonna say, okay, wait, let's not make this decision based on this assumption. You're also going to recognize how narrow your current solutions are or how amorphous they are because they don't really support anyone. Um, and also multiply the, uh, the, the amount of goals that your organization can support. Um, so, oh, and here's my not horoscopes slide. Um, each person can be a different context. Here's another um, set of examples of different thinking styles. These are the thinking styles for people who just went through a near miss accident. So a near miss accident um, was often an actual accident, but it was a minor accident in people's minds, but that's how they defined it. So I'm not defining it for them. And one of them was, let this be a lesson. You know, wow, I, I skidded out on this icy street. I'm gonna remember on cold, cold mornings not to take this particular street anymore or something, right? Maybe it was downhill. Um, or maybe, maybe I'm trying to teach a lesson to this other idiot, <laughs> right? A little bit harder to do. There's also the troubled about it, someone who's like constantly thinking, laying awake at night, replaying the scenario in their mind. This could be you um, in a different context than the let this be a lesson. And then there's the downplay it. This is what insurance is for. Fine, it's covered. I'm not going to worry about it. I might worry about the insurance company raising my rates, so I'm not going to worry about that accident itself or the near miss accident. Okay. So, just to give you some more examples. Um, so, so, that thinking styles, all of those thinking styles were derived from listening sessions in the problem space with people. Remember, I'm not using the word users because we're speaking about problem space. We pay more attention to it. Um, the common, I don't know if I should go into this, but um, the common misconception is that thinking styles were actually derived from marketing segments. Um, if people haven't read Alan Cooper's book, um, they'll think of thinking styles uh, as derived from marketing segments and the marketing segments are pure demographics. That's totally understandable because they need to place ads and to place ads you need your demographics um okay so uh i'm going to skip over this part and talk to you guys about mental model diagrams mental model diagrams are like a city skyline and it's a model uh that your team shares about how people approach their purpose notice i'm not saying user i'm saying people and it's how they're approaching that purpose of like maybe trying to lose weight or maybe recovering from an accident. Um, you can map your own services to the towers and mental model diagram and see where your gaps are, see where your weaknesses are, see where the areas are that you wanna focus next. Prioritize, put in order a bunch of things to do for the next two years. Look at, in this case, your competition and see how you stack up against your competition. And maybe differentiate yourself against your competition. Um, here's another example. They all look different, but they all contain these towers and then these items slotted below those towers. This is yet another one, a little bit prettier. Um, and all the time when you use them, what you're doing is you're going through them before each design cycle, saying, okay, where are we focused now? Which approach are we focused on? And which thinking style are we going, or thinking styles are we going to support through this approach? You can see um, that some of these towers are different colors because they represent different thinking styles. And so you can pull those out. You'll go through these, you'll tag them, you'll work with them with your stakeholders. This is how you're making your decisions 
where to go next, what to do next, and how it fits in with the grander picture, okay, including your, your competition. It's giving you that depth and breadth. I mentioned the Grand Canyon, so I had to put a picture of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> anyway, um, there is a company called USAA. It's a uh, insurance company in the U.S. Clearly, um, and they learned a lot when they made their first mental model diagram. First of all, they learned that they've been running their business based on their own understanding, and their own understanding was that you know you you have a crash, you make a claim, we go through your claim with you and then we close up your claim and you're all done right maybe your car got fixed um but the closing of the claim is not the end of the experience for that person that person might have physical damage might have emotional damage might feel guilty because their mother-in-law was in the car with them and they gave their mother-in-law whiplash now it's going to be a topic of conversation every time you go see your mother-in-law oh my god there's a lot more that you're dealing with. In addition, perhaps your car got totaled and you are not in a financial position to buy a new car or finance a new car. And this was a big aha moment for USAA because that insurance company also is associated with a bank. And they thought, you know, my God, we can help people finance a new car if this is the scenario that they're in. Um, also, one of the things that they learned is that immediately after the accident, you are in a certain emotional state and you can't think straight. And they knew that, but they were not supporting it. And indeed, when you called in to file your claim, they would offer you credit card um, offers. <laughs> when you're in that emotional state, oh my God. Um, what people wanted was to have someone walk them through what to do. I'm too emotionally stressed, tell me what to do. I would be able to do it if I was clear headed, but right now I'm kind of shaken. Um, so they're going to support that. And so this is, back to that picture, the idea of connecting these arrows over to the opportunity backlog, over to the ideas that you want to support. And now you've suddenly got proof that for this particular thinking style and this approach, you're, it's risk free, it's gonna be awesome people are going to be amazed that you understand them, that you listen. Okay, so here's a list of other activities that you would use a mental model diagram for. I'm not gonna go through them all because we're using up time. But basically my message is let's avoid doing it Silicon Valley style. Let's pay attention to the problem. Um, if we wanna make the world a better place, we really have to be aware of our biases, we have to be aware of the context we're working in, we have to go out and find more information so that we can support a broader set of people. Remember that long tail picture, there's a lot of opportunity out there. So with that, my final slide, I've got a newsletter, I've got books, I've got um, audible version of the book, I've got advanced online training, and I've got the second edition of Mental Models coming out probably mid-year next year. So I want to thank you so much and thank you, Chos, for having me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Yay. I will stop sharing unless somebody wants to take a picture of that screen. Uh, that's a good idea, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because the girls that, that walk out, um, they just, they have a train to catch. So it wasn't yes, I think, yeah, I totally figured. <laughs> yep. And that's at the point at which I looked at the, uh, at the clock and I'm like, oh, I better wrap this up. <laughs> we have places to go. Okay, I will stop sharing. Yay! No, but uh, thank you so much. We learned so much. I just want to double check if uh, Namso is on the line. Namso, are you so. there? Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh Hi. So I've been here the whole time and listening to your awesome talk. Yay. Any questions? And I, learned, and I learned a lot as well. Especially the so when when people are doing the user research and then they use these dark notes, you know. And so and sometimes you notice they use different colors, but I never really figured out oh, different colors for different thinking models. So mm -hmm. I understand that now. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Very good. Yay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, really good. Yes, exactly. I think this is the direction everybody's gonna gonna go next because okay. we've, we've done a bad job. <laughs> Yay. Any questions from anybody in the audience there or any questions? No. <laughs> I can't do it. Oh, let me hold on. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. Well, I think it's not turned on. I still can't hear. Oh. Maybe the button on the bottom. Is that better? Ha. Huh. That. Okay. Try again. <laughs> no. I'll turn up my volume all the way. <laughs> yeah, just come up. <laughs> awesome. Um, I just want to say thanks so much for the for the wonderful talk. It was really so beneficial. And I got to learn so many new um, aspects of research and, um, and empathy. And what I really enjoyed was a, um, your bit on the opportunity maps. So I really think that it would mean that um, it, it's especially like if you're on the product management um, area, it really mm -hmm. like a, a really look at how you actually um, prioritize your backlog or your your product feature development. Yeah. Um, so I'd really like to take forward a lot of what you mentioned today with my company is to see what yes. you guys did. Yeah. Just, Yay. Yeah. So thanks. Um, also, will you be sharing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh -oh. Another question? Are we frozen? There we go. Honestly, Yay. The, for the presentation is very wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. so my question is that is there such a thing as being too empathetic? <laughs> well, define empathetic, right? <laughs> With Jay's presentation, I thought it was just being overly sensitive. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's it's not right. It isn't. That so, isn't. No. yeah, I think um, the only time I would ever say too is like if you are practicing listening on some of the people who also listened in on this talk or read these books um and they're all like hey you're doing it to me <laughs> you're like yeah i am <laughs> i think it depends on the situation when you dial you don't want to have lots of empathy because you don't want if, you, if you're nice to people there's going to be a queue of people waiting. yeah <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I know. Actually, after the listening session, so many people are like, oh my God, this is like a therapy session. I feel so good. Because <laughs> it's so rare that anyone actually listens to us. Yes. Right? Yeah. Most of the time, we're thinking of what we want to say next. Yeah. 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 And, and what activities can one do to um, enhance the empathy, natural innate empathy? I think one of the activities is to define them, to be very specific about what, like the three that I went through today, uh, I think it's very, those are the three most important for our industry. And the second thing is to practice, practice each one of them. Um, practice emotional empathy. When you notice somebody going through an emotion, like in a meeting or something, afterward, after the meeting, stand aside and do, you know, go through the four steps. Hey, I noticed your emotion that I did in the meeting. So here I'm going to stay out of judgment and I'm going to say, hey, I noticed your emotion. Do you want to you know, tell me what went through your mind there? Um, or, you know, wow, that sounds really important to you, right? Even as simple as what they said in that Inside Out animation movie. Um, the third one is the cognitive empathy. Try practicing that whenever you feel strong enough to do it. Um, I'll do it a lot like in line at the grocery store that's like a super short period of time where you're standing next to a stranger and you can sort of open up a conversation and see if you can get them talking like oh wow it looks like you're making a large meal and they'll say oh my god there's this one lady she has like lots and lots of marshmallows and rice krispies and i'm like 
you must be making Rice Krispie treats. And so she goes on and on about, she's building the Golden Gate Bridge out of red Rice Krispie treats <laughs> and why she's doing it, right? And where her thinking is coming from. Get down to the reasoning. So there's a lot of different opportunities that, uh, that we find ourselves in that we can do listening. I have a little caveat though when I teach this is it's really hard to do with the people you're around on a daily basis because you have habits of speaking and assumptions will come up and when you say something the other person will assume you mean X when you really meant Y because you're trying something else new. <laughs> so it's easier to try practicing it with people that you know, maybe aren't your family members <laughs> at first. You'll get good and then you'll be able to do it with your family members. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, come in. Yeah. Okay, so basically, I know trying to read someone's mind is bad, but empathy is good. How do you, how do you distinguish between the two? Just, I don't know. Sorry. I, I, okay. Well, trying to read someone's mind also has a lot of definitions, right? So you might be on the, on the side where you're making assumptions about what that person's thinking and you're not checking what they're actually thinking. Or you might be on the side where you're reading body language and you're like going, oh, wow, I noticed that thing go across their face. Or you're reading tone of voice. I do my listening sessions by phone so they're not in person. So we subtract body language in that case. But you can notice tone of voice and you know what something triggered it, right? The whole key is to make sure that you go and check, right? And there are lots of ways to check. It's super simple to do. And, and a lot of us are a little bit, I don't know, um, we, we, I am a, a, an introvert. <laughs> so it's a little bit difficult to like sort of just go up to somebody and start talking. But the more I practice this, the easier it is and the more fun it is because it's all these connections that you're making with people. It's amazing. It feels great. Um, because you're giving them your respect, you're witnessing what they have to say, and that feels good for them, which in turn feels good for you. Um, now, I can't remember what your question was. <laughs> Did I answer it? <laughs> okay, well, what I also do it. I start answering a question, and I make a point, and I forget where I kind of wanted to go with it. So the question is mind reading versus empathy. Yeah, so... Like I mentioned, there's two different kinds, assumptions versus body language. There's a certain level that you know. Empathy, though, let's talk about the three kinds. In affective empathy, what you're doing is you're noticing an emotion. You might be wrong about what emotion it is. But what you're doing is you're saying, hey, I noticed that you said blah, or you feel blah, or it looks like that was hard for you. That's just opening up, inviting that connection for them to talk and you to listen and stay out of judgment. Um, so that's very different than mind reading. Um, there, I, I often say that you have to have listening sessions because we have not yet developed the telepathy server, right? Once we get the telepathy server, then we don't have to listen to one another because we can hear each other's thoughts. Um, <laughs> it might be a little, too wild <laughs> but listening is the antidote for guessing listening actually that is, that is, that is, yeah what i've experienced is like someone um i'm dealing with someone okay mm -hmm. and this person is constantly making assumptions of what i'm like kind of what's going on in my head and i'm like i kind of want to tell the person look you're not really uh, yeah. good at this kind of thing and the thing is he doesn't really listen or anything he likes mm -hmm. guests instead of listening is this person in a hierarchy above you uh, well i'm not gonna go there uh, no, that's my <laughs> <laughs> i was just gonna say because yeah it's it's sometimes hard or next to impossible to get someone to listen to you when it's not something they've learned how to do i mean you could maybe give them the book practical empathy you could give them another book that's very thin and it's called listening well um by william miller it's super thin and that's a fantastic book um that's the kind of thing that might work in some situations and might make that person very angry in other situations <laughs>
right? Yeah. It's the contextual answer. <laughs> Thank you for your answers. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, uh, oh. I lost my place. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Yeah, is there any more questions? Okay. Thank okay. you so much, Indy. Um, yeah. I really enjoyed that. I learned so much.